On today's podcast, Jamie Christian. Jamie is a professional bodybuilder, personal trainer, and now, quite literally, the largest star of BBC TV's Gladiators. Enjoy the conversation. Jamie, welcome to the podcast. Mark, well, pleasure to be here, mate. Uh, thank you for having me on. You, you are one of those people that's had an overnight success that took you decades <laughs> to achieve. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, 20 years of like hardcore bodybuilding and living every day like it's just the same day. But it's like that film, what's that film where Tom Cruise plays the same day over and over again? You, you've already you've already aged me because when you said, what's that film? I was thinking Groundhog Day, <laughs> yeah. uh, but but you were thinking um, Edge of Tomorrow. That's the one, yes. It's actually a quite good yeah. film, to be fair. Yeah, although I, I, I'm just going to rate Groundhog Day higher. Um, let's uh, let's start with Gladiators. Then we're going to go back and, and kind of talk about how you got into bodybuilding and stuff in the first place and and, and, uh, and kind of go up to Gladiators. But starting there, how, how did that come about? How, how, how's that work? Did they, did they pick you? Did you volunteer? Yeah, so um, I was 37 at the time, 38 now. I was doing a show in October 2022, the fourth show of the year, and that was actually my best competitive year I did um, the best as a pro I'd ever done and that was the kind of my kind of breakthrough year so to speak even though I've been competing tw- uh, since 2009 and as a pro from 2018 and we should say do we should just add when you say show this is professional bodybuilding yeah professional bodybuilding like because well, otherwise people might be thinking what sort of show are you doing pantomime what's going on <laughs> yeah. so, so yeah <laughs> pro bodybuilding show pro bodybuilding. right trying to qualify for the Mr Olympia if uh that makes sense to people. If not, it's like the FA Cup final of bodybuilding. Yeah. Um, and my missus has said to me that year, I think this will be your last year competing. I was like, get out of town. You know, I was competing until I was 40 because I'm a bit um, I'm a bit weird with numbers. I have to have round numbers. Like if the TV's on 23, it's got to be an even number or 25 or 30. Right. Um, so that was that. But anyway, in October, I'd compete, and, and I, st- I think she'd sowed the seed in my head, and then I looked on Instagram, and there was this advertisement from BBC about um, bringing back the gladiators, applications for, you know, apply to be a gladiator now. I was like, my God. I don't know. Do you used to watch the show as a kid? Uh, well, yeah, I'm, I'm a bit older than you. I used to watch the show as an adult. <laughs> right, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So... Uh, I, I, Gladiators was, uh, I forget actually, was, it was around so, early 90s, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, I think it was like 93 to 2000, something like that. Yeah, so so, 90, so it would have started when I was about 1920. Okay. So yeah, but but absolutely. In fact, fine enough, I was a gym instructor uh, when, it, when, it was, when it was big. Yeah. Um, I say gym instructor back then, that just meant you, you basically worked at a leisure centre until someone said, go and cover in the gym. Yeah. And then you're a gym instructor, sure. zero qualifications. Right. But but yeah, we were we were having people coming in, uh, yeah, wanting to train to look like Wolf and so so yeah, I was kind of I was involved in the industry while it was kicking off, uh, uh, yeah, first time round. Amazing. So yeah, I, I watched. I think I was like eight years old, so a little bit younger, but um, still obviously very much inspired and kind of one of the reasons why I got into fitness originally. And it was just the door was ajar, and I just thought, you know what, if I don't go through this now, because essentially for bodybuilding you have to be all in. And I have friends yes. that had the opportunity to apply, but didn't because of the nature of bodybuilding and not wanting to not have an off season and not grow for the following season, etc. cetera. Um, I went through the door and obviously the rest is history. We got there. Um, the application process, and I'm going to name a film that you probably relate to as well. I would describe it as like the best of the best. Yeah. So just, yeah. you know, the best athletes from around the UK going at each other in physical tests that you're scored on. And then obviously um, there was um, bit pieces on camera where they see if you've got on camera. Done a few YouTube videos, not not to the level that you have, but, you know, I've had some practice on camera and I'm not too bad. So long story short, I made the cut. They obviously had a character in mind for me that was this larger than life, um, bigger um, kind of giant character that these kids could look up to and think, oh my God, like, you know, I think essentially we're the modern day superheroes for kids um, yep. and I fit the bill. So yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> uh, actually, it's interesting. So, because for anyone that, that hasn't seen you in, in either on Gladiators or on social media or, or, or wherever it might be, you are a huge human being. <laughs> so you're, what are you, you're 6'5", yep. 
Uh, what are you weighing at the moment? So at the minute, this morning I was 272 pounds, which is very light for me, to be fair. At my heaviest, I was 343. Yeah, so, so that's, um, that's yeah, I mean, for a, for a human being on two legs, yeah. that's a lot. It was a lot of weight. So in fact, funny enough, you say light for you. We, before we started this, you just told me that your arms are hanging on around 21 inches <laughs> and, and you're feeling quite small at the moment. <laughs> yeah, see, that's obscene. So you get there. And what I'm wondering is, because you're so big, are, are there are there other people there with you when you're when you're kind of going on to whatever audition and so on? There's other fitness people there. Yeah, uh, uh, you must dwarf a lot of them because typically a lot of people, especially CrossFitters and stuff, and bodybuilders as well, being shorter lends itself to that, doesn't it? I mean, there's not many CrossFitters that are above five ten. No, definitely and, not. And, and the same with bodybuilding, it, it, it makes it easier if you've got less to fill out. So were you there feeling just absolutely massive compared to all of them and just thinking, I've got this in the bag? Or were you thinking, uh, oh, I'm, I'm too big, I look odd? It, it, you know, what, what was going through your head? Well, I've gone through my life feeling a bit odd, to be fair. You know, I was playing, what, we, that, That's why I wondered, yeah. yeah. Playing football as a 12-year-old and being two feet taller than other people and like me and them in the face by accident was a bit odd. Well, I suppose that's got me used to the the the, the whole scenario of being odd, and and I've I've gone through my life, and now it's just normal. Well, actually, is it normal, or do you? Because because uh, the reason I ask is that it's not normal because yeah. you're still bigger than most people. And, and when I was, so I'm six six, so I'm a, actually I'm getting old, so I'm probably down to your to your height now. <laughs> when I was when I was say when I was little, when I was a kid, yeah. I felt really out of place yeah. no matter where I was yeah. and it almost wasn't until in fact then I got into financial services where I was just then an odd financial advisor because I was really big and then when I got into uh, YouTube actually kind of helped because basically I could I could just play on the fact that I was just bigger than normal yeah. but still able to do things that other people could do so it, it worked but it took me until I was almost 50 to kind of figure out a place for me to be yeah What's weird is that my one of my kids is six seven, so he's bigger than me, and he, from the minute he suddenly realised he was taller than average, has completely lent into it and just loves the fact that Love he's it. tall in a way that I never did. I never had that confidence. So I wondered with you because being big has always lent itself to what you were doing anyway. Yeah. Whether when you put yourself amongst others, you basically have my kid's ego that just says. I've got this, or my childhood ego, which is everyone thinks I'm weird looking. I think there was a changing point in my life, and that was bodybuilding, because I was the awkward, felt a bit weird, felt a bit out of place, strange, until I started competing. Then I'd realised that, yeah, I'm still odds, and the odds are stacked against me. But that gave me a lot of um, like mental power and resilience to prove people wrong. And that's something I've tried to do throughout my career is prove people wrong. And then I start to realize, you know what? Um, I'm actually encouraging other tall bodybuilders to get into it and, and have a go because they've been told for years that you're too tall, you can't do it. So I think having the identity as this tall bodybuilder that's kind of carrying the torch, so to speak, gave me a purpose and gave me a level of confidence that got rid of all those weird feelings that, that were there before. Yeah, no, it's interesting because I I, I I know that feeling. And, and when I first started doing YouTube, I'd get other people saying, oh, wow, I'm 6'7". I never knew you could run at 6'7". Yeah. I'm like, well, yeah, of course you can. And suddenly you become that kind of, yeah, that example for others. Um, it's cool that you found it so early on. Okay, so you, you get to go to the you get you get picked. What, what's what's that experience been like? I mean, the last year, I guess, has just been crazy for you. Yeah, it's been a, it's been a whirlwind. You know, that's the difference between bodybuilding and something like gladiators, right? You've gone from a niche yeah. sport where the minority of the world know who you are to something absolutely huge where I can't go in the local Costa without being asked for a photo or an autograph. And people still do autographs, by the way. I thought they were like really old school. But yeah, um, selfies and autographs. So just from that perspective, and, and the, the stranger thing for me is as a bodybuilder, I would have a definite specific audience and you could, you could put them between this bracket here. But the audience for Gladiator is anywhere from like three years old to 73, 83 years old. And I was in David Lloyd's the other week and I had these two, I don't, I don't want to say, 
how old I think there was, it was like older ladies, um, like grandparent, definitely grandparent age. And they were queuing up at the desk. I yeah, if, they, they, if, they, if these ladies were like 52, I'm going to be really annoyed. <laughs> I reckon there was like 70. <laughs> so you, you're safe. But they were queuing up and I thought they was waiting for the manager because I, I was speaking to the manager and um, two minutes had passed and we turned. They said, excuse me, could we please have a photo? I was like, yeah, of course you can. <laughs> so, yeah, it's been strange or wicked. And it, but isn't that, isn't that great? I like it when people say to me on the, on the YouTube comment, they'll say, look, I'm not your target audience, but I loved your video. Yeah. I'm like, well, hang on a minute. If you love the video, then you are absolutely my target audience. Think, yeah. yeah, no, because I, I imagine in bodybuilding it was, as you say, a bit more. In fact, did you even get, apart from when you went to like bodybuilding expos and stuff or at shows, obviously you're getting recognized, but, but were you getting... I, I guess you're getting spotted in the street when you're yeah. big, just because you're big. But were you getting recognised, or is that a, is that now a fairly new thing for you? It was infrequent. You know, we'd, we'd usually go to, say, Meadow Hall Shopping in um, Sheffield, and there'd be one or two people that'd say, oh, I recognise you from Instagram or YouTube. Like, I'm sure you're very much aware of that yourself more so. Um, but now it's just like, I can't go anywhere without being recognised. It's almost, it's so strange that my mindset is, it's weird if I don't get recognised. And I think that's me getting used to the whole process of it all. But, yeah, now my mind's just, like, switched to... It's not... An, I don't want it to sound like um, big-headed or anything because there's a level of expectation that comes with me now going out in public that I'm going to be recognised. Um, but that's, I think that's just, that's just how it is. Um, so if I do yeah, make it down yeah. the street without being stopped or make it through a shopping... Um, supermarket without being stopped. It's like it's not. I'm not going to say it's a win because I enjoy meeting people and speaking to them about the show and everything else. But it's uh, it's just odd <laughs> at the minute. Yeah, no, it's it's interesting because because you're. I mean, I I get I get recognised, but but no way near the level of recognition that, that I'm sure you're now getting from 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 TV. But but I got to a point where I was at an airport recently on a flight, yeah, and and I managed to get on the plane and nobody. Nobody while I was at the airport had come over and said, "Oh, are you Mark Lewis," yeah. and I, I almost felt like, well, "What happened there?" Yeah, I, I yeah. delay this, delay this plane. I need to go and sit down for another couple of hours and wait for someone to spot me. Yeah, and, and so, uh, and and then the filming of it, the the, the process of, of putting on the suit, running out, and so on. That must have been a bit surreal day one. That, that yeah. Almost, I mean, yeah. What what? In fact, how did that compare to things like stepping on stage as a pro bodybuilder and stuff? Was it? Same, better, different. So I don't normally get nervous. Um, and to be fair, listen, this time I was wearing plenty more clothes than a bodybuilding show. <laughs> I was going to say, anyone thinking, yeah, you're, you're wearing some wacky stuff. Yeah. So yeah, they want to see you on stage. Yeah, in your, my, in your thong. My little thong, yeah. <laughs> so no, I, I was. I don't normally get nervous. I'm used to crowds, but um, what happens is we stand on the side of the stage and then we get all get called out individually and walk on from each side. Um, and the music's playing and the audience at Sheffield Arena was mad, like three, three and a half thousand people, kids screaming. So it's like, oh my God, this is like... And the first few times were intense, but in a obviously fantastic way. But you know that you're also not live, but you're on camera and you've got to make your walkout look good and that's going to be shown on the TV. So it's all these things running through your head. But what a exhilarating experience it was I, I loved every minute although it was nerve-wracking to start yeah I, can, I bet what, what happened when it when it had its first uh airing on tv did, did you have all the family around and stuff was it was it was it that kind of thing where yeah, yeah you yeah. all kind of gather around and watching gather around children that mark that's the best thing about it i know we've spoke um before and i know you're not uh, a license holder so you've not watched the show but one thing you're now confusing Americans because Americans are thinking, "Hang on, you need a license to watch TV." <laughs> yeah, that yeah. they're sat there with their AR-15 yeah. that they just picked up at Walmart, thinking, yeah. "You need a license to watch telly." <laughs> yeah, you do in this country. <laughs> um, but the best thing about the show, literally, is that I've been told this by like hundreds and thousands of people. Um, it's got the kids back on the sofa with the family, and yes, you know, I, yeah. I haven't seen. My kids will be on YouTube or their phones in the room because they want their own privacy and that mum and dad are watching something they don't want to watch. Saturday night, 5.50, BBC One. It's like, kids, come down, glad it is on. And that's in my house. And 
thousands of other homes around or millions of other homes around the UK. So yeah. for me, um, because it's happening to me and my family as well, like we're doing that. That's the best thing about it. Yeah. Yeah. Cause that had Saturday night TV had kind of stopped being a, a thing for the family. Yeah. You, you know, you, you might, because kids aren't watching, I'm assuming kids aren't watching whatever the ballroom dancing thing that was, Strictly. Or, what, 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 what's that celebrity dancing on ice, yeah. whatever it's called. I got no idea. You can tell I haven't got a TV license. Yeah. <laughs> I think the last thing I watched on TV was probably Noel's house party. <laughs> um, yeah, no, the idea that everyone just kind of gathers around and watches the same thing is, uh, it hasn't been around for a while. No, um, not. Yeah. So, so cool to be part of that. Also, I imagine a bit different to being a, going on stage as a bodybuilder. Cause when you go on stage as a bodybuilder, you know exactly what you're doing. And you've qualified to get there yeah. through a a, a a process whereby if you weren't good enough, you simply wouldn't be there. Yeah. Whereas I guess with gladiators, you're, you're doing something that you don't. It's new to you. Yeah. You know how are you going to do? It, it, there must be. It, it's almost as though you've been kind of. I, I mean this. I don't mean this negatively. You've always kind of been elevated beyond your status. Yeah. Because because <laughs> you suddenly you're now a TV star with zero practice of being a TV star. Yeah. Whereas when someone said to you, you're a pro bodybuilder, you thought, well, I've been doing this for donkey's years, so I, yeah. I know what I'm doing. For sure. It's definitely like a sink or swim scenario. And like you said, the expectation is for gladiators to win. That's it. It's, yeah. this, this giant character is going to absolutely pummel these com contenders. He's not going to lose. He can't lose. Look at him. Yeah, so there's a lot of pressure. And on, and on prime time TV, yeah. it's not as though yeah. you, you can hide if you do badly. It's like, oh, nobody would have seen that. Exactly. How to make yourself accountable, right? Just put yourself on TV. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's funny because I, I occasionally show a clip of me being on TV doing some stand up comedy years ago. And it, and it went out on ITV7 at three in the morning or something. So the only people watching it were people that I said, watch this. Yeah. Um, and, and so it, it looks quite grand, but in reality, it was seen by about eight people. Yeah. Um, you, you can't hide on BBC at uh, whatever, seven o'clock in the evening. No, definitely not. Let's go back, because th the thing that I'm interested in, uh, hugely, whenever I talk to someone that is into their training, and especially bodybuilding, is is how they went into it. Uh, and particularly because for, for, for you, because it was similar height, I can remember being too tall for bodybuilding inverted commas yeah. so i can remember being sort of 15 years old which would have been kind of mid 80s and and thinking oh yeah bodybuilding's around as a thing it's certainly not what it is today in terms of popularity yeah. but i can remember just kind of discounting it and thinking no i'm, I'm too long uh, i'm never gonna you know it's just not gonna work um obviously you didn't you didn't conclude that so how did you get into it what age were you when you thought this is this is what I want to do, or was it just from other sports and it just sort of kind of blurred into into bodybuilding? Yeah, so I was always active as a kid. I always um, did athletics at school, um, played for numerous football teams. I mean, like most kids, playing football four times a week, two training sessions, two weekend matches, and that was like my whole, probably from ten years old right through to my early twenties. Um, but then at the age of 16 years old, leaving school, joining sixth form, I was best friends with some guy that uh, started the gym. I was like, ah, it's kind of cool. I'll come along with you. I remember watching a guy in the gym lift um, 20 kilo dumbbells on flat press. I was like, oh my God, that's strong. You know, I couldn't even lift the bar. You, when you do the shaky bar at the yeah. start, I was there. But um, along that timeline, we'd actually, we were best friends and we'd met two girls and started going out with them at the same time. I remember to say, now you remember vividly, there are certain members walking on this park with these girls in two, we had matching vests, me and my friend. I had a navy one, he had a white one, Reebok vest. And just thinking, yeah, it would look good in this vest with a good set of arms. Um, but aside from that, I had the um, same story as a lot of people at 16 years old. Well, maybe not. This is actually, I know I'm saying this, maybe not everyone did this, a sleepover with another 16-year-old lad watching Pumping Iron. <laughs> okay, I'm going to stop you now. No. <laughs> That's probably no. not the norm. <laughs> most, most uh, no. I mean, I, I can, I, we, we had Pumping Iron playing 24-7 uh, in the gym. Yeah. Uh, but but no, there's a lot of 16-year-olds out there now thinking, no, mate, never did that. <laughs> the reason why I said that was because I'm not on a bodybuilding podcast, right? And they can relate. Yeah, you got a lot of people now thinking, hang on a minute, this dude's 16 years old, pumping iron overnight with some other 16 year old dude, <laughs> looking at his arms. Yeah. The, 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 these two girls that, that were mentioned a moment ago are now completely forgotten. What's going on here? Yeah, this... <laughs> <came over. laughs> but, 
<laughs> following from that, we actually started training my conservatory. I got one of the old York um, bench and barbell sets from Argus. Yeah. I think the ones yeah, 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 yeah. I have one of those. Yeah. yeah. And we was pumping out um, DJ look garage music in the, in the uh, conservatory till many like early hours. <laughs> doing bench press and bicep 21s. So that was it, yeah, really. Yeah. From there, I um, I was in a gym, which was essentially an old-school bodybuilding gym, and they had an in-house show every year. Um, this is 2009, so I started training in 2001, so eight years in, in the future. After- Actually, interestingly, at this point, you're still sort of 16, 17. Yeah. Were you, um, but because of your height, it's it's notoriously hard for taller people to to uh, they they can take on huge amounts of size and weight, but but they will always look for any given weight smaller than somebody shorter. Yeah. Um, and uh, I mean it, it's um it's much to the frustration. In fact, you know you got guys on on YouTube like Joe Fazer who's who's you know permanently talking about his 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 kind of body image and his struggle because he's six three and he's a young guy and he's just finds it massively hard to get big. Then yeah. yet his arms, if you if you take a, I mean, to, to you, this is going to sound like like you've been on a starvation diet, but if someone's got a 16 or 17 inch arm and they're 6'3", yeah. it's it's going to look pretty unimpressive. But the 16 inch arm on someone that's 5'7", is going to look, uh, for example, if Tom Cruise had 16 inch arms, people would think the guy had suddenly got jacked overnight. Yeah. So uh, were, were you just genetically blessed as it were in that regard or or did you find it equally hard i'm just kind of thinking of all the kind of tall skinny kids out there yeah. now that are thinking oh. you know what about them Do you know i think the main thing is now obviously we live in a society with social media that we we see results in front of our faces every day we see the end result every day well i was not brought up in that time and i didn't see the end result so i was never really chasing anything and i started training in 2001 I won my first British title when I could say my physique was starting to resemble something like a bodybuilder in 2015. So that was 14 years right. training yeah. before I yeah. started to even look like a bodybuilder in my eyes. And yeah. But nowadays you train for a year and if you've not kind of made it or you don't look like you, the end result, it's, um, it's time to give up. I think that's the main difference. Yeah, and it's, and also kids nowadays they'll see guys like Sam Sulek and stuff on on, on TikTok, yeah. who who just genetically is 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 blessed with an ability to blow up and and does everything he needs to do to for that to happen, yeah. and it does look like it's happened overnight. The idea of training for ten years plus, yeah. it is um just doesn't compute with no. uh with Instagram. Definitely not. Um, but I mean, I'll I'll tell you, I was fourteen stone. 13, 14 stone when I first started training. Um, so for the Americans, that's like, I think 14 stone is 196 pounds. So I was sub 200 yeah. pounds. Yeah, at 6'5". Six, at 6'5", six five. Six five, yeah. So I, yeah. I, I looked thin, but, you know, in my head, I was shredded. So there were benefits to, to looking like that. And then I think I just went through a period of trying to put a stone on every single year. I want to be 15, 16, 17, 18. And... I ended up being on stage when I finished 300 pounds. So I'd put on like a hundred pounds of stage weight muscle in the 2009, 13 years of competing. Yeah. It's, it's that, that message is never heard. When I mean, you talk about putting a stone on a year, so a stone Americans thinking, what the heck are these stones at 14 pounds? Yeah. Putting on 14 pounds in a year at, at six, five is, is a sensible, steady progression. Yeah. But but you watch yeah, any any kind of movie star, you'd assume you can just throw on thirty pounds in six months yeah. for your next role, and it's just that that's what they think nowadays. So so yeah, so you did it slow and steady. Yeah. Actually, while you were doing it, what um, so in terms of in terms of uh, what was going on at that time? So two thousand, say two thousand one, you started training. Yeah. Okay. So two thousand one, bodybuilding wasn't, um, and when I say bodybuilding, I mean just people training with the objective of just being bigger yeah uh, an aesthetic training it, it wasn't anywhere like what it is now um what were your what did your, your folks think of that and your and your friends aside from aside from your buddy that you're pumping iron with um 
And we should say as well, in case anyone is thinking, what, what the heck's pumping iron? Uh, 1977 documentary following Schwarzenegger's win of the 76 Olympia, I think yeah, it was, think so. um, with him and Lou Ferrigno. And actually, Lou Ferrigno, was he, was he, were you, you say you weren't watching what other people were doing. For me, Lou Ferrigno, because he was like an incredible yeah. Hulk for anyone that's, and when I say the incredible Hulk, I don't mean Mark Ruffalo. Uh, or Ed Norton, I mean the original Incredible Hulk. He was a big guy, six five, six six. Yeah. Um, was was he one of your kind of oh it can be done inspirations? I think so. And then there was uh, Rolf Muller as well. Was the, the other tall, yeah yeah was six six? I think he was. So yeah, we, we're also from the best of the best. Yeah, there you go. Uh, actually, no. I, I, actually, Rolf Muller was in Best of the Best too, wasn't he? Yeah, and I, I think i think kill I'm, chris penn i don't want to i don't want to quote this so i don't want to be wrong because it's really bad but i'm going to say it. i think he was like an american gladiator at one point i'm sure he was was he i'll tell you what he wasn't he was in he was in gladiators yeah no, uh, not was, gladiators yes. he was in gladiator the, the russell crowe yeah um movie he was yeah um yeah and, and and anyone who wants to go and follow up on some of these movies you're probably better off watching gladiator before you are watching best of the best too <laughs> unless you're a massive chris penn fan um and even then he dies in the first five minutes, so don't bother. Um, okay, so so your yeah, friends and family. What what are what are friends and family watching you do this thinking, given it is still a bit niche and a bit I mean, in simple terms, a bit weird. Yeah. You know, I can remember my mum watching me lifting weights when I was a kid, and she just thought, That's weird. Why aren't you out playing football? I think I was in a bit of a different position because my uncle, so my mum's brother was a, a competitive bodybuilder at the time. So they were very much used to what it entailed. And that's why my mum was supportive and my nana, so my brother's mum, nana, I don't know whether it's a term that many people use, grandma, um, mama. <laughs> um, she was like, oh, just be careful. You know, like grandma's trying to look after you anyway. She said, just be careful, it's a dangerous sport. Hey? Just look after your health, don't get too heavy. Um, but the support was there. I'd say the biggest change was, the more serious I got with bodybuilding, I think this goes for any competitive sport, right? You, you know yourself having set these massive challenges. When you're in the zone, you're kind of on your own with it. You segregate yourself away from friends and social environments. And that was my life from about 23 when I decided, right, bodybuilding is the one. This is the path that I want to choose um, 100% all in. And essentially, the social life went down the toilet. So really popular in school and then real kind of like um, energetic, busy social life up until my early 20s, going out, partying and stuff like that. And then it was a sort of focus. So the, the amount I saw my friends was probably like 90% less. And that's why I've ended up with, I would say like four close, close friends that I still talk to today that were from those times that they're good enough friends that you don't need to see them every week and speak to them all the time. Actually, it's interesting because one of my questions for you was how did you handle people's uh, opinions? Because people outside of the world of bodybuilding, especially back then, yeah. would have would have looked at it as a very niche thing. But but I guess you kind of answered that by saying you didn't care, you lived in your bubble. Yeah, I did. Um, because essentially I knew that it was me doing it for me. I enjoyed it. And they ended up obviously turning it into a business as well. So then it's it's not just going to the gym. It's not just competing. It's actually my job. Um, and, but that comes with its own problems as well. When you're in the gym training, normally that's a social environment. And I got to the point where I got anxious to go into the gym because I knew I was going to get approached and spoken to about um, diet, training, whatever else. And it was like, oh, God, this is my time to work. So I used to get an anxiety about going to the gym. And so you progress to competing. As you mentioned, your first your first competition was that that was run by your local your yeah. local gym. Was that how that that worked? Yeah, two thousand nine. Um, and <laughs> this is the thing about competing, right? Isn't it? So I didn't come anywhere, and I was like, the judges have got it wrong. You know, I've got been robbed. They must have added the scores wrong. <laughs> but yeah, because it's a funny one. Because obviously bodybuilding. Is so subjective. Yeah, it, it's um, yeah. What one, one judge's um winner is another judge's second place. It's uh, it's not like well, I was faster, so you know that's it. Exactly. But that's what spurred me on really to just think. No, I want this even more. I think anyone competes for the sorry anyone who competes the first time, 
they get that bug or they don't. And I, and I got yeah. it. So I was back the next year and then I won the show. So I was like, yes, come on, <laughs> make amends. Actually, there, there is a running theme here that your, your attitude to being told you can't or you're wrong or you're not good enough is, well, I'll show them. Yeah. Uh, and a lot of people's would be, oh, well, then I better stop. That, that's the, the yeah. opposite, isn't it? It's, um, 100%. If you, if, you don't, if you don't place, well, I must suck and I'll, I'll, you know, I'll go and do something else. Yeah. I remember 2015 when I said about early winning the British Championship. So I lived in Mansfield at that time in, in uh, Nottinghamshire. And I was training at a, another bodybuilding gym, but because I was a bit of an outcast, I'd recently moved to the area. That gym was like notorious for competitors and seeing com competitors come through that gym. Many, many good competitors came through the gym. So as an outcast and someone who looks different, taller, I got told by many people in that gym, you're not going to do anything. To the point where it got that bad, I left the gym and trained somewhere else. But anyway... Um, Front and centre when I walked out that British finals were the two people that owned that gym. And I won the show. And when I went out to collect my award, they'd gone. I was like, that's amazing. You know, that just proves the whole, just prove them wrong in like yeah, one, absolutely. one competition yeah. done. Yeah, it's that, um, I, I, it's interesting because one of the things that, that I've always wondered about is how is how bodybuilders um, handle doing something that is, um, outside of their world, viewed a bit weird, or certainly was then. Yeah. Uh, or certainly not necessarily understood. That's probably a better way of describing it. And then even inside their world, you'll still have a chunk of people who who don't rate you. You know, if you if you're a Usain Bolt, you're simply the fastest, and therefore that there's not much to argue with. Yeah. But in your world, even people inside your world can. Uh, can have you know, varying opinions on, on on your ability, not not just on you, but on how good you are at your sport, yeah, sure. because it's so 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 subjective. And and the answer appears to be how how do you cope with that? Is you just kind of uh, think screw everyone, um, <laughs> revert to your own little bubble, train, come out and prove them wrong. It just appears to be that. Yeah, I, I put on my Instagram story this morning. To be fair, something about not taking life too seriously and other people's comments too seriously as well, because. Essentially, other people's comments, uh, I, I feel, or this is how I turn it into the, the thing that I'm speaking about, is I see that from a place of like jealousy, of envy, of that you've got something that they want, so don't rise to it, don't give them what they want, essentially to bring, them, bring you down to their level, rise above it by proving them wrong, doing the things that you know you need to do to be even better and be that person that they say that you're not, um, and just beat beat that guy. Actually, that's interesting. So, so uh, on on that theme, as as you got more and more successful in pro bodybuilding, social media would have been becoming a bigger and bigger thing. Yeah. Um, how did you find that and and using that and 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 basically exposing yourself to a much wider group of people than just bodybuilding fans and, and with it i'm assuming as you say comments and feedback that that wouldn't have been always um positive yeah i, I think you know i'm not going to say I, I, this is an overnight thing where i just didn't worry about what everyone thought because essentially i think everybody to a degree worries about what other people think and, and right right we're in that yeah, um, yeah absolutely in that um world of social media now where the negative comments are there and they do definitely catch your attention more so than 10 people saying, Oh, I love you. I love your work. You look great. Blah, blah, blah. Someone says you've got crap calves. Like why don't you train them? That's going to attract your attention. <laughs> yeah. And it yeah. has done for many years, but I mean, Mark, I, I saw a Michael Jackson meme um, yesterday and I had to post it on my own story. And it was about calves. And when he's doing his tiptoe thing, the meme was something like, um, when someone says you've got skinny calves the next day in the gym, you're going, you know, all the toe raises. So I've learned to just take the mick out of myself kind of. And, and that's my way of giving them the notification that I've seen the comment, but also the notification from myself that doesn't really matter. I'm not bothered what you think. And I can also make a joke out of it, you know, backhanded way of saying nice try, but do it again. <laughs> Yeah, it, it, it's a weird one. Why 
uh, in your head, that one comment takes on a, a, a gravitas that yeah. that the the thousands of positive ones didn't. Yeah, uh, it, it makes no sense. But uh, one of the things I I hear a lot from people getting into YouTube for the first time is is how do you handle the uh, I mean, they, they they label it hate. Hate's not really the right word. It's just people being dicks. Yeah. But how do you deal with that? And it is, it's a hard one because the easy answer is, as you say, you, just, you either just play with it, you know, you just playful with it and brush it off or you ignore it. But yeah. for some reason, yeah, it, it is weird. Yeah, you get, you, get, you get a thousand people saying you look great. One bloke says, um, skip leg day. <laughs> and, and, and you're rushing to the gym to do squats. It's, yeah. <laughs> it makes no sense. I think as you get older, right, I, I, I just think that you you get this um, this mindset towards or this realization really that what other people think doesn't really matter, and I just think that's what's happened to me over the years. You do you need a thick skin, you need to stay in your own lane, but essentially, what other people other people's opinion of yourself shouldn't matter. It definitely shouldn't define who you are, um, and I think that's where some people fall foul. They try and essentially be someone else not themselves um, yeah 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 it's an interesting one we do a thing uh jen my wife and i on our on our friday podcast that we do for our patreon members where we we take the most ridiculous comment that's been made that week by somebody yeah. on one of my youtube videos and we basically just talk about it and have a laugh with it and we, we've kind of turned something that used to just wind me up into something for, for our own amusement. Because because in fact, even now it still happens. I had a video recently that I did with a, a kid that was an incredibly fast park runner. Yeah. And um, he, his name's Louis. He uh, he posted on his own Instagram, "Hey, my video with Mark Lewis has just gone over a million views." Wow. And it caused me to go back and look at the video and just see because I hadn't realised it was doing that well. Yeah. And the first thing I see when I look at it is is one of the top comments or most recent at least, was something basically saying, this old bloke's useless, he can't run. <laughs> and and I ignore the fact it's been seen by a million people, yeah. which, which is a number that you can't even comprehend. Yeah. And instead, I then spend like a, an afternoon fixated on the fact that this guy, th I'm like, what, he thinks I can't run? I, how, how rude. Yeah. I'm going to find this guy in wherever, Ohio, wherever he was, and and you know challenge him to a race or something. It, it, it's bizarre how you... Yeah, how you get fixated on the wrong things. You, you clearly are going about it the right way. Um, Try. So, yeah, well, yeah, indeed, yeah. So, bring us up to um, date with your training, because what's what's interesting now is that uh, again we're talking this off air slightly before we started. You're now dropping weight. You're slimming down. What's what's caused you to do that? Why, what are you looking for from your fitness now, and and how are you finding the the transition? Having spent all of your adult life just obsessed with getting bigger yep. to, to now looking for something a bit more diverse, perhaps. Essentially, you know, like you alluded to earlier, being 340 or just 300 pounds every single day is a chore and it's a big effort and it, it's a big demand on your body and it takes a lot of energy to keep that. Um, Actually, why? That, that's a great, that's a great point. I, I, I say why, because I have so many people say to me, oh, I wish I could, I wish I was, you know, Chris Bumstead size. And I said, hang on a minute, have you, have you seen the guy just sat on a podcast or something? He, he struggles to just sit comfortably in a chair. Yeah. It, it's just, and, and by his own admission, can't physically do things he'd love to be able to do. Yeah. So, so when you are massive, what, because people assume that you are, um, you know, it, it's very, they, they, and it is very different. It's very different to being 350 pounds obese. Yeah. Clearly, I'm not, I'm not, we're not, I'm not putting it in the same category. Although, funny enough, I saw Greg Doucette recently saying uh, obesity and pro bodybuilding are about as, as healthy as, as each other. Um, <laughs> I, I, I'll leave you to go and argue with Greg on that one. Um, but, but yeah, what, what is the, the downside of, of just lugging that much weight around? So, Mobility for sure, one, like tying your shoelaces is difficult, which shouldn't be difficult, right? Um, just being tired all the time as well, all the food consumption, the lugging the heavy weight around. I always say when I see somebody who is obese and not, um, I say big out of choice, maybe it obviously is their choice, but when I see a big person that's not a bodybuilder, I just think I know what that feels like and I wouldn't yeah. choose to be like that every day. 
unless I had a real good reason to do so, like compete as a bodybuilder. That's a good reason because that was my living. Um, I just can't get through my head how someone would choose to feel like every day. Like the, the feeling of that would be enough to stop me from doing the things that were causing me to be like that. Um, so yeah, mobility and limitations. Limitations with family, not being able to even go to the theme park and go on rides. So yeah, n nowadays I just want to be a bit more functional, but essentially, gladiators aside, spend time with the kids. I've got a 15 year old and 17 year olds. So if my son wants to go and play football or wants to go to the park, play some basketball, I want to be able to do that and not be out of breath or have to have an hour of sleep when I get home because I'm knackered. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you're not, you're, not dunk, you're not dunking at that weight either. <laughs> no, no, definitely not. And and that's another thing, Mark, you know, the impact on your joints. Um, I just think the the pressure on your organs and your body as a whole, I don't think bodybuilding has a long lifespan. Um, and that was the reason why I wanted to stop at 40. But that was the reason why Gladiator is as, as great as a show is. It was such an easier decision to make because like, okay, 37, I'm now at this doorway and this opportunity to spend more time with my family and be a better father and enjoy life and do different things like the cycling and running, hopefully, um, because that's what I've had to do. I've had to learn how to run again, which is mad, right? 38 years old. Why have you had to learn how to run again? Have you had a spinal operation? No, my body forgot how to move. Yeah. It was yeah. like literally moving up and down and forwards and backwards. That was it lateral planes of movement and used to, if i went back to play football now i wouldn't just tear a hamstring i'd probably tear my whole body in, in like five different bits <laughs> yeah, it's, it's really funny because when i was 38 i was just starting my fitness journey but from a point of being grossly overweight yeah because I, because after my 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 brief career as a gym instructor I, I then took my career in a different direction that just involved um eating food non-stop and uh, that actually, what well, that was my career. In case anyone thinks I was a professional eater, it just uh, I just was allowed to eat a lot. So we both almost started a, a, kind of that fitness, it, it, what I would regard as proper fitness, yeah. for, for want of a better word, at the same age. But what's funny is that the things you're talking about um, feeling limited by because of your size are in many ways exactly the same as they were for me. Yeah, you know, I couldn't tie my shoelaces either. I, I wasn't jacked. I was just fat, <laughs> but but the same and and feeling hungry all the time because yeah. and people think it's insane if you're eating all the time why you're hungry all the time because when you're massive, for whatever reason, just going for a walk is a massive calorie expenditure. Yeah. So you you want to eat all the time and getting up out of a chair and and just feeling. And I used to get into my car on a hot day and because I was just so big in that little car. I'm immediately just sweating and it's just, yeah, it's just a chore. It looks really cool. I say it looks really cool. The jacked version of being really heavy looks really cool on Instagram. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, for, for day to day living, it's, um, it's not always cracked up to me then. It's not practical. I mean, I remember times when I struggled to get myself out of the bath. I was like, <laughs> I should be, I'm not, not old enough or, I don't know how you got in a bath. <laughs> yeah, well, I say to everyone, a bath is very important. I love a good soap, but it's a two-stage operation. So you've got to do the, the legs in and the body out, and then the body in and the legs out. That's, that's it. Yes. 20 minutes each, yeah. <laughs> And what we should do, actually, if anyone's listening and sells massive baths and want to uh, sponsor us, they, they can send us a couple of big baths. And <laughs> yeah, I'll be all over that. Okay, so uh, your your kind of uh transition into being into being fitter what what's that looking like in terms of things that people can relate to in terms of run let's let's, let's look at running actually because running is an interesting one yeah because i regard running rightly or wrongly as just something that that unless you have an obvious medical reason not to be able to do you should be able to run um doesn't mean you should be fast doesn't mean you should be breaking records but you should as a human being able to jog along how are you finding running yes yeah, so running running and you just alluded to a good point there about just being able to jog along this goes yeah. back to my bodybuilding mentality like everything is hundred or nothing like i can't just do something and it's like when i'm on zwift right you just yep. i just say to myself right i'm trying to do a lot of zone two at the minute so i'm trying to just stay around 200 watts plod along 
130 beats a minute on the heart rate, something like that. And then someone comes past me, I'm like, now he thinks that I'm just going slow. And in my head, the cogs are turning. Like, I don't, I'm, yeah. I know I'm a lot, a lot faster. I can keep up with this guy. And then you just, I get dragged in. So it ends up being like a really intensive session. I come in the, in the, um, in the front room, full on sweat, gasping for air. And the missus goes, you did it again, didn't you? <laughs> so yeah. running, you, I've obviously spoke to you off the podcast. Um, I've been trying to run um, quicker than I probably should have started out running because I wanted to do the high rocks. Um, and that just kind of just flared up my lower back straight away, I think, because of the weight, um, the hips, and all these things that haven't been moving for a long time. They're just yeah. saying, it's like the warning beacons are going off and, and, and the plane's going to hit the mountain. You know, pull up, pull up. The body's saying, stop it, stop it. <laughs> um, I could run slow, so definitely. But could I be competitive? Could I run as fast as I wanted to in my head at the minute? No. So it's about having a plan and a strategy to be able to do that, which I'm not good at. I'm not good at having a long plan. I want everything, you know, I say, said it earlier, you want everything now. I do want everything quick, but that's only because I know I'm capable of doing, like, you know, in, in, um, sporting things. Although what's funny is you said earlier how, how many years it took you to go from uh, average teenager to pro bodybuilder, yeah. and yet now you want to go from crappy runner to good runner overnight. Yeah. 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 No, That's I, right, because I, I went, at the age of 38, I was probably doing a 42-minute 5K. I was staggering around. Yeah. And at, at 50, I was doing yeah, not not far off 18 minute 5k. Yeah. Um, but it, but it took 12 years to, mm -hmm. to, to get there. Um, out of interest, if you were to go and run a 5k now, just to give people an idea, and, and yeah. uh, th th there's a reason for asking this. If you had to go and do one, if you had to go and do a park run, if I, I keep telling you go and do a park run, and every Saturday you text me and say some other bullshit excuses <laughs> why you didn't do it. So <laughs> if you had to, what time would you like? Would you be happy with it, a pike run right now? 5K, so, plodding, plodding around. I don't know whether... Not stopping to sign autographs. No. <laughs> I don't know whether... In my head, I'd want yep. to do 30 minutes, but I don't know whether that's um, a good time because I think that's like one I probably shouldn't be aiming for at my very first one. This is why it's so good for people to hear this. 30 minutes at a park run is around about average. I, th I think the actual average is like 28 and a half or something. Yeah. But if you ran a 30-minute park run, which is what my wife does, yeah. you will finish middle of the pack, hundreds of people behind you, and a ton of people ahead of you. You're, you're very average. However, for people that are running and, and listening to this podcast that are, that are of a running background, they're going to regard 30 minutes as being um, a, a, bit, a bit lethargic. Yeah, And so it's so important for people to realize when they talk about, because I hear so many times people say, oh, my genetics for training are rubbish. I think, well, hang on, your genetics for training to do what? Because you clearly have elite genetics for, for getting the size you got. That, that's yeah. a, a, a gift, inverted commas, that, that you have. But, but right now, there's nothing that says you've got great genetics for, for running, and, and not, not that you should, but it's yeah, I hear so many people just get fixated on on their ability to do one thing isn't what they'd love it to be, and therefore it's kind of game over. Yeah, and and it's so useful to hear that people that are, that do have an elite ability in one area don't have it in others. In, in other words, everyone's crappy at something. Yeah, um, I've now got people doing thirty minute park runs, kind of you know throwing their uh, throwing their <laughs> toys out the pram. But my point is, you're an, you are an elite athlete. It's how you would be described. Gladiators would describe you as kind of, you know, the, 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 as you say, a superhero. Yeah. And yet you're a superhero that, you know, if you had to chase down a bad guy, um, you, you better hope he's got a limp. I was going to um, say, he'd probably get away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, your, your, your superhero power is if you do catch him, you, you kill him. It is, it is fun, but, it, but it's so useful for people to hear that, that yeah, you can be great at one thing and not so great at another. So people that say, "Oh, I'm, a, I'm a, you know, I, I can never have great genetics for building muscle." Well, maybe not, but but you might be you might be great at something else. We look at guys like um, I'd look at people like Michael Jordan, who was arguably one of the best athletes in the world ever, yeah. and and was playing basketball at like 215 pounds, 
215, if you tell someone you're 215 and six foot six, they're going to assume you're, you're some kind of skinny loser. Yeah, no wonder he could float. <laughs> yeah, everyone can do something, um, or most people can do something. Yeah. Uh, cool. So, um, yeah, your, your uh, ideal kind of not finishing point, but, but where you'd like to get to with, with your fitness is, is what? Do you want to drop more weight or have you got a weight that you're thinking that's comfortable? <laughs> or, or are oh, you getting yes. concerned? Are you thinking, oh my goodness, I'm going to be, I'm going to yeah. be some 280 pound weakling? <laughs> no, this this is the thing, Mark. That um, you know, I had a, I had an identity as a bodybuilder, and I have an identity as a gladiator in a completely different realm. But yep. that identity requires me to look a certain way. Yeah, I've been told by the missus many times that that is 280 pounds and above. Like when you go below 280, you start to look skinny. I'm like, how can someone 20 stone look skinny, right? Like you said, yeah. you're yeah. 15 pounds. Uh, to, to loop back around to your question, I think my plan is to be as good at these other tasks as possible, running, cycling, any functional sports that I get involved in, but be as good as those as possible as a larger individual. Much like, yes. you, you know, you're six foot six, you do all these things and you're a larger individual. I don't want to be as fast as possible as a, a, a skinny giant, I want to be as fast as possible or as good as possible, as strong as possible as the size human that I need to be, which is essentially 20 stone and above. Yeah, yeah, which is which is a great objective because, uh, well, well, for one thing, it's, it's going to be quite straightforward for you to be the fastest 20 stone park runner yeah. because there's not many running in that competition. Mm -hmm. um, I did the same. I, I'd look around when I finished a park run and think you know, I got beaten by a ton of people, but none of them were six six two twenty. That they're all they're all five eight, you know, one fifty. Yeah. Um, so you need to, and also the age uh, and the joy of being fifty now is if I get beaten by someone that's thirty five, I couldn't care less. You know, yeah. I, I, I'm for one thing they're going home to change nappies and all the things that thirty five year olds do. I'm not. I'm, I'm doing yeah. what I like. I'm fifty. I'm an old man. I, I, I have freedom in that sense. So, yeah, it's, it's important to kind of bubble yourself um, with, with people that are like you if you want to play that who am I as good as game. You don't need to do yeah. it at all if you don't want to. Yeah. No, I think you're right. And I think um, you made a great point about wanting to be great at running straight away. Um, and I think another issue is that, you know, having a, a done things like football and being athletic in the past, that bodybuilding window was 20 years of my life. Yeah. Not, I can't just rewind and go straight back to playing football and running like I remember I used to. It's uh, it's now a process that starts again. So yeah. the bodybuilding journey, almost the running journey and everything else, it starts again. Although what a fun thing, because you get to do exactly what I did, which is that for most people who have run all their lives, when they get to 38, they are on a downhill slide now i mean they, yeah. they are going to get slower and slower and slower and then be dead yeah whereas okay. you get to do exactly what i did which is you, you know you're running slow uh than you'd like you're going to get faster as you move into your 40s you know, you're going to be a faster runner probably yeah. at 45 than you are today yeah which is which is a a fun thing to do definitely the only thing i'm not quite sure about is um is zwift and whether that will become just an annoying prospect. The fact that just to hold three watts a kilo, I've got to hold 375 watts. And uh, learn, learn to just suck it up and deal with it on Zwift. Because I mean, Zwift, if anyone doesn't know, is basically uh, computerized cycling. You pedal along, and your little avatar is your is your rider in the virtual world, and it uses your weight pretty much. Well, it uses your weight and your power, and as you say, it gives you a watts per kilo, and and that's basically how fast you go you are never going to be um, particularly fast. I mean, you can be fast. I mean, actually, go back to Greg Set. He's, he's a good example. He rides on Zwift, yeah. Cat B rider, and, and does really well for a, for a heavy guy. Yeah. But it's all relative because, you know, he's, he's, I think he's like five foot two. Um, yeah, he's probably <laughs> still only 80, 85. Yeah, two. I think he is. So, so basically, and he's got... So yeah, it, it kind of works for him. It's and to give you an example to do something like up out to Zwift, which is a fairly kind of classic thing that Zwifters do. They try and ride up a mountain within Zwift within the hour. 
which I've done a couple of times, but it takes 3.2 watts per kilo. Yeah. So I'm, I'm 220, 100 kilos, so I need to hold 320 watts for an hour. And that's just grim for you. Yeah. It, it, you you'd need to be... Um, you need to be an elite level cyclist yeah. to be able to do it at your weight, which is, yeah, That's hard insane. work. My, my wattage would need to be over 400 for an hour, wouldn't it? Which is just, remember the Bradley Wiggins video, that's not happening. <laughs> it, it, it's Bradley Wiggins there. What, what you need to do with cycling is get out onto a real bike race, ride, not necessarily a race, but a ride where you get to kind of look around and think, okay, I'm not going as fast as that guy. But, um, you know, he's, he's 115 pounds and I'm, I'm, you know, I, I look the way I look. Not that that's a better look, but it, but it, it kind of gives validation to why you're going the speed you're going. Yeah. On Zwift, there's nowhere to type in, you know, but I'm jacked. That, <laughs> <laughs> no. That they need that avatar. You should better pick an avatar with 21-inch arms. Yeah. And then need... other people would know why. Yeah, we need something. We need more, more than it's given us right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes, if Swift are listening, we want we want jacked avatars. Yeah. Um, so I wanted to finish off on because it fascinates me and and, it, and it's interesting to talk to you about it because you've gone from pro bodybuilder to kind of social media um, giant in, in, in every sense, and now also trying to get into more trying to gain more fitness, uh, and also you you coach people as well. Yep. Um, for, for training. What is, what's going on and is it good or bad with the obsession lately with everybody just wanting to get jacked that there doesn't appear to be as much enthusiasm for people wanting to just get fit, although the term fitness is, is commonly used, it, it really does come down to being jacked. So in your training that you provide for others, are you seeing people coming to you and just saying, I want to get big? Is that a thing that's that's going on? Because when I was a coach, people would say, I don't want to, even men would, I say even men, men and women would say, I don't want to get too big. I just yeah. want to be able to run, play football, whatever it might be. What's going on now? Everyone wants to get massive. Yeah, I think... I don't think it's a bodybuilding thing. I, I think it's more so like um, mainstream media and films like superhero Marvels. They're all in front of us, aren't they, all the time. And essentially that's what kids look up to. That's what they kind of see from a young age. But probably as a parent or a teenager or mid-20s, being a role model for kids or being um, the, the, the biggest amongst your peers and friendship groups, that is that is a massive thing, isn't it? Um, I've kind of come full circle with that from obviously coaching bodybuilders for many years. That's not something that I try and aim to do now. I don't try and aim to coach competitive bodybuilders because I'm not in that sport myself. So I think unless I'm in it, then I shouldn't really be helping people do it because essentially somebody else is going to be more passionate to help them do it who's involved in the sport directly themselves. So I developed this thing called the Super Blueprint. You might have seen it on my socials, but that's yep. aimed at busy dads who have kids who want to be role models physically for their kids, but feel and look better themselves. And that's more directed towards being healthy, having good habits. So you've got good gut health and digestion. You feel more energetic and you've got more zest for life. And, you know, a lot of these guys want to gain muscle, but I wouldn't say they want to be jacked. They just want to look and feel better. Um, so I'm hoping I can get that out to more people because I think there is a message that is thrown at us all the time about this physique and shape that is the ideal. That is way, way in the um, the realms of just like cartoon. It's fabricated, isn't it? It's not real. But we, we deem it to be real because it's thrown in front of our faces all the time. It's interesting. I'm, I'm going to disagree with you on, on on only one thing i don't think it's i don't think it's film and mainstream mm -hmm. i think it's entirely social media and, yeah. and the reason is in so i was 10 years old in 1983 and i was 20 years old in 1993 so that was my kind of window when i was thinking what do i want to be when i'm a big boy kind of thing yeah and that we we had in those 10 years i mean 83 stallone was already massive from from the rocky films rocky 2 was 83 i think 
Rocky Rocky Four was massive for me, 1986, seven, I think. Um, Schwarzenegger was getting big. Uh, Terminator 2, 91 was just, I mean, people forget, and if you weren't there, you, you wouldn't know, Terminator 2 in 1991 was, people say oh, we've got The Rock now. Schwarzenegger in 91 made The Rock today look like a nobody. But it never made me want to go and be a bodybuilder. Uh, I think it's social media where, unlike a movie where you see that one big or not big actor briefly and then you go on and watch something else, every single morning when you look at social media, if you follow guys like or whoever, whoever you follow on social media, you're presented with them every single day. Yeah. So I, I blame social media entirely. Not that it's a bad thing, but it, it is the cause of, of youngsters thinking aesthetic, aesthetic, aesthetic. Um, yeah. And I couldn't care less if I can run or not. Yeah. Oh, no, it's it's based on trends, isn't it? What's trending? It, it's trendy at the minute to be jacked. It's trendy at the minute to be in shape. Trendy to have a six-pack. Um, and I think the algorithm of our searches will be throwing out the same things all the time as well. Like somebody who's probably into fishing might see a lot of fish, <laughs> maybe less, less jacked men. Actually, what they'd be seeing is uh, they'd be seeing uh, jacked men and jacked women fishing. Uh, you, 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 you can't get rid of the jacked people. They're everywhere. Maybe so. Maybe so. That's a YouTube video in itself. It, yeah, there, there is. There, there, if, if it's not, it's a niche that someone should exploit. Yeah. I mean, we, it is. Yeah, it, it, it just it fascinates me, the, 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 the current obsession. And, and what I like about you talking about kind of slimming down inverted commas for gladiators and also more importantly wanting to get into stuff like or not get into but be able to run yeah. um and we've spoken about doing high rocks and stuff i mean that i just think is is inspiring in such a really useful way for people to see not only someone like you doing that but also someone like you um having to get good at doing that that there is a, yeah. that it's you can't just step into it no and, and that's a great point as well, Mark. And I think that's something I've always tried to do. I've, I've always tried to not be afraid of being vulnerable and show your weaker areas and show your weaknesses in terms of not being great at things and hope that you can inspire other people to follow suit because essentially there's a lot of people out there in today's society that are scared to do something because it's not as good as the influencer doing it on, on the thing they're watching all the time. Yeah. Yeah. And I, 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 exactly that. I, I enjoy now doing something and being a bit rubbish at it um i i did a run at the weekend and i came second to last i'm struggling with a bad back at the moment i but i went and plodded around it took me two and a half hours to do 10k uh, 10 miles well on the podcast i will commit so i've put it out into the universe and other people have seen it i'll commit to the october high rocks in birmingham me and you, let's go. There you go. Okay, well, well, I, I, I better get my back fixed then, because otherwise I'm going to be. <laughs> because if you, if you, uh, if you do the whole of the sled push and I then can't even run, that's going to. I'm just going to look like some old bloke dragging you down. That's uh, <laughs> awesome. Really? I tell you what, 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 what it, what it reminds me of you doing high rocks and doing some things amazing and doing some things. I mean, let's be honest. You and me doing burpee broad jumps is is going to look like scaffolding falling down and not getting back up again it's going to be a yeah, horrific they are painful but what it reminds me of is watching something like superstars back back when i was a kid where you take elite athletes who could clearly just crush some of the challenges because they're elite athletes but then you watch you know jeff capes try and run 100 meters or something and you think okay the guy can't do everything and maybe i can do that faster than him yeah and and suddenly, it, 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 that's where I think inspiration can come from. Um, people seeing people that are good in one thing but have a weakness elsewhere that they might be able to live up to in a way they can't, you know, people can't be a pro bodybuilder yeah. like you, but there's plenty of people who better do burpee broad jumps faster than you. Um, yeah, sure. and, and why is one better than the other? I, I, I love that. I love that kind of, yeah, just exposure of normality from people who are otherwise um, at the top of their game. Yeah. Uh, awesome dude it's been it's been fascinating and, and a pleasure chatting uh, i always like talking to people that are very good at one thing and trying something new it's uh it's just fun to hear about how they're getting on um yeah. and uh congratulations on on how it's going on tv and, and i'm so glad that i got you before you were an even bigger star and you wouldn't even consider such a podcast 
Yeah, that, mate. No, it's been a pleasure. I've, I've obviously watched you on YouTube for the last year or so, I would say, and I know you're a great talker and we, I knew we were going to have some good conversations today. So it was a, a no-brainer, mate. Yeah, no, it's been a lot of fun. Superb. Mate, thanks for your time. I look forward to talking to you again soon. Mate, thank you very much. Pleasure.